Excerpt from my completion nearing book, Writing Beyond Realism, Ishikawa Jun in the Case Against Modern Japanese Literature, a critical study of his early fiction and essays with translations. So this section comes from the last part of the book, the translations, and there are translations of uh, three works of fiction and four critical essays. This is the third critical essay. And the uh, version in the book contains copious footnotes, but here I will just read the translation, the text. Okay. Uh, prayer, Norito, and Prose. In Japanese, the original title is Kito to Norito to Sanbun. Was first published in the May 1942 issue of Gendai Bungaku. Nearly five years after the publication of the Song of Mars, Mars no Da. The war was now raging on two fronts, China and Southeast Asia. The anti-war tone that marked that earlier work is conspicuously absent here. The essay, told in a kind of meandering documentary style, explores various subjects loosely connected by the three terms of the title, Christian prayers, Shinto Norito, or ritual chants, and Japanese prose. The subjects include French poet and First World War casualty Charles Peggy, Gothic writer Izumi Kyoka, mimetic notions of writing based on the author's everyday life diagram, Seikatsuzuke, and psychological diagram, Shindizuke, categories of interiority and in the literary genres they spawned, naturalism's failure to go beyond the life-based life -based hypothesis, Nagai Kafu's importance as political and social critic and his controversial story House for a Mistress, 1912, as the genesis of the modern Japanese shosetsu, in Ishikawa's words, the Kojiki, Japan's oldest chronicle, and the notions of prayer and the divine in Shinto, Japan's native religion. While there is much to admire in the essay, Ishikawa's description of Shinto as a timeless unchanging force that pervades all aspects of Japanese culture and society, now and forever, is problematic. In the modern period, Shinto is recast as State Shinto, Kokka Shinto, a quasi-religious imperial ideology used to bolster the state. By extolling State Shinto in this way, and by de degrading foreign religions, Christianity and Buddhism, Ishikawa opens himself up to the charge that he is echoing the natural nationalistic myths of his day. Readers will note that the second section of the essay is largely a critique of the mimetic conception of literature, that primary target of Ishikawa's early works. The essay was anthologized in Volume 7 of Kindai Bungak Hyoron Taike, Compendium of Modern Literary Criticism, published 1972. Okay, that was the introductory blurb to my translation of the essay. Here is the essay. Part 1. <clears throat> Lost in a certain thought, I wandered idly through the streets of Tokyo until I chanced upon Ueno Zoo. After stopping briefly there, I drifted on to the seedy part of town, where I stopped to rest at the dingiest street corner cafe I could find. I had no particular purpose for prowling the old low city, the Shitamachi area, like this. It was a mere impulse, a sake-inspired curiosity that had now spent me to exhaustion. Yet the object of my certain thought was no passing whim. There were in fact two strands to this thought, train of thought that had so engrossed me. The first had to do with Nagai Kafu's controversial story House for a Mistress, Shoutaku. The second with a certain book by the French writer Charles Peggy. Allow me to explain. I was recently asked to submit a piece to the journal Gendai Bungaku, Contemporary Literature. The request was for an essay on either Moriogai or Nagai Kafu. As it just so happens, last year I published a half-baked book on Ogai. While my modest little book by no means can exhaust the subject of Ogai's literature, I have no desire at the moment to take out my brush and inkstone to re revisit his works. Professor Yoshida Seiji, a Moriogai specialist, happened to review my book in, the, in last month's issue of Contemporary Literature. In his review, he made two criticisms that I should probably respond to. The first has to do with my use of the terms Shizen, nature, and Riso, ideals, in the context of the third decade of the Meiji period. 
but I cannot offer my rejoinder to his point until I have first heard Professor Yoshida's own interpretation in more detail, including his views on the famous so-called submerged ideals debate between Morioga and Tsubot Shoyo, who argued back and forth between 1891 and 92 over the proper status of ideals and ideas, riso, in literature and art. Professor Yoshida implied that the reason I neglected Ogai's autobiographical study Half a Day, 1909, Han Nichi, was that I failed to read the work because I am unaware of its paramount importance. Ignorant and talentless though I may be, I have read Half a Day. My reason for not discussing this particular work in my study was in fact something else. In my private response to the editor I, editor, I insisted rather pedantically that the real reason I neglected to mention the work was because I did not consider half a day to mark a significant advancement in the history of the still-developing form called the Japanese shōsetsu, adding that simple laziness was also to blame. In retrospect, I see that this pedantic insistence on my part about the radical advancement was a bit of an exaggeration, even if laziness was indeed a factor. My real reason for excluding half a day from my study was not because it did not fit my theory of the shōsetsu, but rather because of something more basic. In point of fact, I have never been keen on prying into the personal lives, especially domestic affairs, of other people. I find that there is nothing to be gained from nose-poking in the name of literary research. This alone was the reason I did not address the subject of Olga's domestic lives, life in my little study. Half a day is still teeming with the raw thoughts and memories of the late Mrs. Ogai. Apparently, she didn't even want Iwanami Publishing to include the story in Ogai's complete works. There's nothing I detest more than dragging people's private experiences and raw memories into broad daylight and then using them as fodder for public debate. If my literary study winds up being a tad deformed because I have excluded one or two stories, then so be it. My modest little study wasn't intended to be a full-fledged critique, or a serious work of scholarship anyway. I avoided half a day simply because I felt like it. While the unconscious reason for my oversight may have been my ignorant and ignorance and lack of talent, my conscious reason for bypassing a number of personal subjects was that I simply have no interest in them. Put simply, despite the kind invitation from the editor, editor I have no desire to revisit Ogai at this point in time. Now that I've stated outright that I won't be discussing Mori Ogai, I'm left with Nagai Kafu. But in fact, there's only one story in Kafu's entire ova that compels my attention these days, House for a Mistress. But if I am to pursue this line and attempt to write an exposition on Kafu, that treatise would consist of one simple assertion, that his scandalous short work, House for a Mistress, is by far his best, a monumental, a monumental work that belongs to the so-called Yiping, or untrammeled class of art that goes back to ancient China. This wouldn't make for much of a, much of a critique. Thus, in order to expand the piece into a proper study, I would have to wander beyond Kafu, beyond his house for a mistress. But then I would risk it expanding the essay into something beyond what was originally requested. And so, mulling over a certain topic that will most definitely venture beyond the original request, I began, to re I began to rethink the whole endeavor in terms of my current locations, the Ueno Zoo and the dingy coffee shop in the old low city, but I couldn't compress it into something access acceptable to my editor. The moment you admit, admit to having strayed from a given assignment, you can't help but start writing about the reasons for the change. I've never much liked this word ryu, meaning reason or justification, any subject that can be explained away as a result of some simple reason is always bound to be unworthy of serious discussion. And yet, since I've already dropped the word multiple times in the, these first few paragraphs, I might as well add one more reason to the list. The reason for my abrupt reference to the late French poet Charles Peggy in the first paragraph was that I just so happened to have brought with me a volume of his essays to peruse on the bench at the Ueno Zoo. The seedy cafe that I entered was nothing like those fashionable cafes where slinky girls wait in front of wallpaper to serve you. Rather, it was a simple little coffee shop with a few square tables, each with a glass box on it to serve you a triangular bag of Nanking peanuts wrapped in paraffin, and a number of old grimy magazines piled atop each box. The waiter, a small lad, 
paced up and down the room, in issuing a gruff shout of one coffee, one toast, each time a customer placed an order. The only other customers in the room were a gang of young men clad in windbreakers, not much older than the waiter. Two of these youngsters were sitting at the table adjacent to mine, conversing in rude speech like a pair of high school delinquents. Siding, deciding to join the ranks of these street youth for a while, I settled into my booth and ordered myself one cup of coffee. Just then, an announcement came blaring on the radio. As I'd expected, it was a news bulletin from the Imperial Japanese Army Headquarters. The, tro the troops had scored another triumph and the war was going in our favor. The whole shop fell into science, silence. Then, no sooner had the announcement ended than the two youngsters sitting beside me promptly sprung up and left the cafe, one of them de declaring to his friend, Well then, I guess this means it's, time, it's now time for us to set out for the continent and smite the enemy. Seated near the glass entrance door, I could see them clearly. These two youngsters, who only a moment ago seemed no more than juvenile delinquents, suddenly assumed a dignified, mature air and bid their final formal goodbyes, grabbed their bikes, which were propped up against the cafe wall, hopped on, and rode off in different directions. Gliding into the distance, their august figures hurtled through the soft midday rays of spring sun, and not once turning back, disappeared into the faint, distant dust. I was utterly tra transfixed by those two bicycles. I felt galvanized by their speed. These were two majestic objects, capable of noble deeds. They were not illusory abstractions, but living entities that glimmered whitely as they coursed away. The two young riders were no doubt just some lowly clerks at some dingy local shop, yet the destination toward which they raced was not your usual house of amusement. Watching their receding figures sprint, spirit away, I could sense a vitality particular to those embarking on some harrowing task, such as, say, soldiers charging into battle. We live in an age where even such petty merchants as these have no other means to discharge their plebeian energies than to ape the spirit of our nation's brave warriors. The two youths seemed much happier now as they pedaled away on their bicycles than a moment ago when seated, chatting at the cafe. The exemplary virtue of their bicycles was evident in the way they transformed in a flash the brutish nature of these merchant class rogues who were a mere hair bre hair's breadth away from thieves into focused spirit of valiant soldiers. As I watched them fade into the background, a vision unfolded before me, a high-speed bicycle battalion zooming away on the southern high road to Malay. Would that I too could bid farewell to my associates, hop on a bicycle, and fly off with them to some faraway battlefield. But that is not possible. I don't even know how to command a bicycle. Besides, I'm not stationed out there on the southern high road to Malay. The ultimate end point of my exerted motion goes no further than these sentences that I scrawl with my pen, an instrument that with each line strays further and farther and farther from the original assignment. My deepest apologies to the editor. As I sit here now listening to the gripping update on the war, I, an inveterate drifter, resolve to return every now and then to Kafu's house for a mistress. But before I wander in the direction of that house of naughty pleasures, let me first backtrack to that bench at the Ueno Zoo and offer some remarks on the French poet and Great War casualty, Charles Pegui. Pegui. In his essay Les Ardents, Money, 1913, the French poet Charles Pegui is describing a certain chair. This chair, he explains, is so intricately designed, so meticulously crafted, that its invisible parts and concealed parts exist in perfect harmony. The sheer artistry driven into even its hidden parts would remain unknown to the general public. Unknown, that is, until someone comes along and smashes it apart. Such vigorous and concentrated workmanship is unthinkable to those who are motivated by profit, the desire to show off, or the desire to curry favor. Just what sort of men produced the, this unrivaled chair, asked Pegui. This chair was the product of the humble hands of a nameless artisan of antiquity. Such exquisite chairs, Pegui continues, were no special order for these master craftsmen of old. Day in and day out, these artisans diligently tackled each job, down to the small favors done for neighbors, 
with equal care and precision. They made no distinction between inside and outside, between concealed and exposed parts. They treated their toiling hands and their tools, which were extensions of their hands, with great care and affection. Most importantly, they sang with glee as they went about their daily tasks, day after day. These medieval artisans, argues Pegri, lived their lives in perfect equanimity, devoid of any sub surplus or slack. Long ago there existed here on earth such artisans, such modes of labor and living. Pegui goes on to explain how these master craftsmen had no use for that modern invention known as theoretical or calculated reasoning, thinking, what we call rikutsu, which would become a central indulgence of later generations. What they had instead was an all-powerful God to whom they could pray. Work for them was a form of kito, or prayer. It was the means by which they showed their devotion to their God. Their workshops were veritable halls of worship. And just as they made no distinction between visible and, and hidden when praying to their God, so they saw no difference between the revealed and concealed parts of their craft, carefully crafted chair. The, the essential truth of their lives is conveyed in the famous motto, Travailler s'esprit, to work is to pray. And their particular mode of living in elevated this motto, to a universal truth, giving it concrete reality. Writing about these ancient chairs of France, the poet Charles Pegui assumed the heart of mind of one of those anonymous artisans of old. Yet he lived not in medieval times, but in our modern era, an era where every man is required to confront that inescapable force called politics. This devout Catholic poet blithely ventured into the world of politics as he recited his poems with glee. If we liken the uh, political world of Pegui day, Pegui's day to a globe and then draw this globe as a spherical diagram, we can see that this earnest poet, rather than circumnavigating the surface of the globe so as to form a complete circle, instead shot upward from one of the poles in the direction of Catholicism. Once he had arrived there, he began to pray to God, first by writing poetry and then by taking up the gun ultimately ascending to heaven when a bullet penetrated his forehead in the first month of the Great War. These days one often hears how many of the youth in occupied Vichy France are increasingly turning to Catholicism. This trend seems especially prevalent among the, among the vanquished soldiers of the Vichy army, which is now under Nazi control. This mass turn to Catholicism would explain why that heroic casualty of the last war, Charles Pegui, is now being read so widely. But it strikes me as a shame that the only means of consolation for these desperate youth of conquered French is to resurrect from the countless volumes of their national literature the childish poetry of this martyr hero from the last war. But then again, what difference does any of this make to me? Resting here on this bench at the Ueno Zoo, I shall now put aside my Pegui book. Though this will bring my comments on Pegui to a premature close, as a man living in Japan today, I cannot go on forever about those stray, distant, and alien gods. All the same, I still find it hard to part with the minds of those anonymous artisans of old. Such a focused mindset existed in our antiquity too. The Buddhist statues in Nara, for instance, are perhaps an even more apt illustration of this identity between work and prayer than the chairs of pre-modern France are. Though I shall leave it to our future scholars to explain whether our modern concept of kito, or prayer, came to Japan from east or west, and whether it refers to native Shinto kami, nature spirits, or foreign Buddhist hotoke de deities, let it suffice for now to say that once, in our d distant past, there were certain modes of life and modes of labor that substantiated this ancient notion of prayer, and that there also existed here magnanimous gods of prayer who, to our ancestors' great convenience, stood ready in either the Shinto heaven or that other shore of Buddhist enlightenment, waiting to receive the prayers of men. At this point, let me hurtle through more than a millennium of history in a single line. We find ourselves now in the Meiji and Taisho periods. The god of our distant ancestors' prayers are, prayers are long dead and buried. No need to bore you with an explanation of circumstances of their death and funerals. 
in their absence the lifestyles and labors that once imbued meaning to our notion of prayer have also disappeared. Nor is it necessary for us to investigate out of antiquarian curiosity the ruins left in their wake. What was imported onto this leftover barren earth to replace these long dead gods was an endless parade of profane foreign cultural products. Most notably among them the necessary evil called politics. That baleful spirit that infiltrated our country just as the nunking bed bugs creep into one's suitcase. In the arena of literature, the unruly and irreverent prose form known as the show sets have burst onto the scene to deliver the final blow to the primitive songs and poems of ancient prayer. Soon thereafter, the show sets have started to run rampant like an angry renegade wind mowing down everything in its path. At the risk of rankling the gods of old, it is to this renegade subject of the Shosetsu, or novel, that I shall now turn. That primordial substance, which like a magnetic pole impels the movement of spirit in all forms of our nation's prose, cannot be pinned down or fixed using the shallow ideas of some ready-made theory. Such determinations and prescriptions may work when calculating linear surface area, but spirit advances through exponential logarithm. There may no longer be any gods around to reveal to us the eternal laws of prose, but even so, every now and then a certain breed of writers emerges that can turn out a succession of works by concocting a visual diagram of his own especial mode of life that is populated with foreign or with fa various false gods, not foreign, various false gods. One such writer is the popular Gothic author Izumi Kyoka. At first glance, Kyoka's heart as he spins his ghost story seems to resemble that of the medieval French artisans as they assembled their chairs. Unlike the pious artisans of old, however, Kyoka was no monotheist. Rather, he was a polytheist. He worshipped multiple gods at once, simultaneously bowing down to the Kanon, 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 Bosatsu, Kanon Bodhisattva of Mercy and the Shinto god of scholarship Tenjin. To be sure, the careful craftsmanship of his stories is beyond reproach. His narrators incorporate whichever Shinto kami or Buddhist hotoke that he happened to be worshipping at the moment, at times embellished with a little music, at times spruced up with an erotic scene or two, even at times turned into a full-fledged ghost stories. But Kyoka was an inveterately promiscuous religious believer, a writer of fickle allegiances. Therefore, we cannot regard his literary output as a form of prayer. He simply assumed an air of piety toward all things that smacked of holiness. Whereas the French artisans perfected their craft through deeply pious faith, Kyoka attained artistic precision through surface technique. He prized words and expressions in much the same way that the French craftsmen valued their hands and tools. Script itself for Kyoka was sacrosanct. He regarded the written word as a fetish, a mysterious religious object. You may have heard that touching anecdote about how he would save even his chopstick wrappers if they bore an inscription. Kyoka lived his life by maintaining this superficially pious pose and applying to it all aspects, applying it to all aspects of his everyday experience. At no point does one does his literature outside of <laughs> at no point does his literature exist outside the confines of his own mode of life. Put simply, his works do not exhibit the kind of vigorous movement of spirit that is required to puncture the schematic visual diagram of his everyday life. Izumi Kyoka's ghosts are not the kind that rebel against their creator. Not once did he write a work whose blade turned back against upon its author. The high degree of intimacy between himself and his phantoms is precisely what gives his works a central, a certain measure of realism. No one of this writer of ghost novels managed to die in a state of bliss on his tatami mat thanks to the protection and intervention of all those spirits and false gods with whom he had long been intimate. But what sort of relationship existed between this exceedingly inconstant believer and that baleful spirit of modernity called politics, which occupies the place of gods in our modern world?
Just as the, ma as the master craftsmen of medieval France had no need for calculative reason, Likuta, when building their exquisite chairs, Kyoka was born immune to that modern-born sin known as critical habit of mind, Hihanguse. To the extent that the necessary evil of modernity called politics preserves its grandiose guise of rule, this was for Kyoka simply an another false idol to be perfunctorily worshipped as he wandered about the city. Yet, oddly enough, Kyoka's alliance with this false god called politics was inadvertently nullified by his excessively pious attitude toward it, toward it. His indiscriminate endorsement and openness toward not only this false god, but indeed toward any and all powerful spirits, had the unintended consequence of transforming his own immediate surroundings into a quasi-holy ground. Just as he, as he would walk into a Buddhist temple and rub a few rosary beads or enter a Shinto shrine and ring the bell, so he would obsequiously comply with all the rules and decorum, the li, ritual pro pro propriety, and yue, music, as the Confucianists say, of the political sphere and its rulers whenever he entered their domain. It was only natural then that the political establishment never had any cause to become upset with him. Izumi Kyoka is the type of writer who, no matter what epoch he is born into, will always manage to get by without offending social mores, without contradicting public sensibilities, without displeasing the powers that be. Given this basic disposition, we cannot label him as a kind of moralist such as, say, Mori Ogai. For Kyoka, unlike Ogai, for, for Kyoka, unlike Ogai, fabricates with great ease the persona of a consummately upright citizen by carrying his polytheistic lifestyle to every corner of his life. Once he has fully achieved this persona, he, has, he no longer has to worry about stepping out of line, even when employing the far-fetched stunt of inserting into novels a michiyuki, a descriptive uh, passage or poetic scene that often leads to death, lover's farewell, often found in no plays, uh, while impersonating a female voice. Not everyone has it so easy. Just as the jejun poet martyr Charles Pegui Things do not proceed this smoothly for those steadfast types born into more difficult circumstances, as our native idealistic poet of the Far West Pegui could surely attest. For unlike Kyoka, Pegui had no choice but to grapple with the inescapable modern, modern evil called politics by virtue of his unwavering, unbending devotion to a single god. <clears throat> Izumi Kyoka must, may have thought he had carved out a separate heaven and earth of his own in his writings, but we can now discern the traje trajectory of his career as something quite different, a limp curve that slopes around the Zabaton cushion in his living room. Resting on his comfortable cushion, Kyoka's legs grew so thin and wobbly that he could no longer stand up and walk along the line of exertion that should have solicited the movement of spirit in his novels. In other words, as a novelist he did not accomplish much in terms of the exertion of spirit, uh, effort de l'esprit. This is why so many ghosts abound in his works. Without their support, his works simply collapse. But the simple fact that Kyoka, even while seated atop his cushion, could wield his pen to spin out successive works that somehow link up with the general spirit of the modern Shosetsu is itself a testament to just how vast and wide the world of the Shosetsu had become. The world of the novel has always been a vast territory, a radically free and inclusive zone open to all and sundry. Even someone as feckless as Izumi Kyoka could find his way into this expansive zone and turn out works with relative ease. Indeed, the novel is so capacious that anyone who sets his pen to the page will eventually stumble upon this wide world, regardless of his chosen subject matter, adopted perspective, or point of departure. Rather than quibble over questions of methodology, then, we might come to a better understanding of the show since if we recognize that the writer can break into its world from any angle, any vantage point. It's, and it seems that this recognition becomes all the more surefire once the writer has acquired that godly or beastly quality known as individuality. <clears throat>
It is precisely this abiding belief in one's own singular uniqueness, the conviction that we are each a truly special breed, that proves that we are all natural-born satyr, each of us semi-bestial, semi-divine, satyr, satyr, satyr. Even those who do not clap... Even those who do not ever clap, clasp their hands in prayer to the Shinto gods or Buddhist deities have no trouble extolling and at times cursing that god known as the Self. For prose, you see, has always been the ideal arena for the self-worshipping atheist to run wild in. Perhaps it is only by running wild in this open and lawless arena that we modern centaurs learn how to flaunt and strut this exalted piece of humanity known as the self. Many young cavalier writers have ex appeared on the literary scene with the aspiration to spin out a series of shows from their own reckless lifestyles. Again, I'm referring here not to the writers of our present era, but to those wild desperados of the bygone days of the late Meiji and early Taisho eras. The central problem facing writers of, this, of that historical juncture was how to find this original starting point from which they could embark into this world of the novel. Most believe that if they could just somehow define their own authorial position, they would eventually stumble upon a suitable method. method. They imagine this position not as a moving point, but as a fixed surface, the flattened space of their own mindset, or kyochi, as we say. Many were inclined to dig around in search of this special mindset, as though looking for a spot that would yield a hot spring. Yet, by sheer dint of wanting so desperately to connect up with the spirit of the modern shosetsu, modern novel, these writers were unwilling to simply stow away the dreamed-up visual diagrams of their mindsets for later use, as though they were maps of their psyches. Rather, they believed that a writer's craft, his discipline and training, consisted of his concerted effort to materialize the diagrams of their own everyday life and to ensure that these grids would somehow conform perfectly to the grids of their psychologies. They were prepared, moreover, to sacrifice everything in order to get these two grids to match up. So what if I go bankrupt once or twice, fall into ruin, and bring down a few others with me, they boldly proclaimed. To hell with public opinion. I shall have no regrets, even if I destroy myself in the process. Everything I do is for the sake of literature, for art. If my wild behavior results in a single great work, then it will, all will have been worth it, the highest moral act. Their determination was heroic, their behavior reckless. Here on earth all were preoccupied and pervaded with the vulgar stench of the modern individual, the egocentric human, so it was only natural that they had no time for transcendental concerns such as reviving any of the long-dead gods. It has always been the dream of the Far Eastern literati to actualize the visual maps of their own idiosyncratic ideal way of life. It was this utopian dreaming that gave the writers and artists of the distant past a chance to discover a temporary refuge from the blank, bleak real world or to find the ultimate safe haven for their own mortal existences. Those who somehow managed to turn their private dreamscapes into reality found that they had little to do once inside them. So they convinced themselves that writing poetry and drinking large quantities of wine while wandering within this extra-temporal dream world was just the natural extension of their eminently broad-minded and careful yu yo ko tata natural dis disposition, as the poets of old would often put it. The writers of the Meiji and Taisho periods, however, completely transformed the meaning and form of this older, non-temporal conception of the author's mindset, or kyoji. For the writers of the new era, an author's world was reconceptualized as a clock, in terms of unilinear temporality. This new arrangement saw that time itself was measured according to this newly acquired mindset, and that the movement of spirit was activated and synchronized according to its internal logic and operations. Whether or not this new arrangement actually worked out, I cannot say. Most writers mistook the atmosphere of this rearranged inner sanctum for the world itself. Others confused the act of drowning in debauchery in the brothel district with real life as such. 
As a result of these conflations, onerous new concepts such as kibun, emotional moods, temper, and shinkyo, mental states, came into being. Among the fashionable literary products de derived from these newly invented categories of interiority is that dreadful literary form known as the modern zishitsu, a kind of degraded version of the traditional zishitsu or miscellaneous essays, in which authors simply follow zi, the brush, hitsu. Despite their claim to be authentic shosetsu, these miscellaneous jottings are really no more than bland reports about the author's private life. In fact, of all the myriad genres that emerged between the intersection of Meiji and Taisho, the early 1910s, and today, it is the modern zishitsu that no doubt epitomizes our nascent modern literature's most degraded elements. It is a shameful chapter in the story of our modern literature that we have regularly witnessed these professional hacks pilfer and misuse the novelist's privileged access to the literary establishment under the pretext that it was vacant. Yet, at the same time, even those who never stooped to churning out miscellaneous hack in the manner of the professional essayists eventually ran out of steam midway and failed to establish their own unique mindset or kyoji, often, often ending up throwing away their lives as they had earlier declared, thereby fulfilling their long-cherished desire for personal ruin. On the other hand, those who managed to make it halfway in their writerly endeavors without completely ruining themselves eventually ran out of steam. Awakening to reality, they either joined the ranks of salaryman, having discovered themselves bereft of any talent or craft, or continued until they hit rock bottom, descending into an alcoholic vagrant in the streets. Amid this great commotion, how many authors from the outset without once pandering to the notion that the author must first construct a schematic diagram of his own unique lifestyle, followed the movement of reality while steadily acquiring its velocity, unconsciously adopting a postureless posture in the self-demarcating manner of Moriyogai, and staking their entire lives on making it in the perilous arena of the Shosetsu, managed to survive to our present day? In fact, there is only one, Tokuda Shuse. I shall not go into Shusei at length here. The fact that Shusei is the sole surviving survivor among countless casualties should give you a sense of how dangerous the literary world was at the time and how much damage was sustained along the way. Next, among those who staked it all on making it as a novelist, even at risk of death, how many, just as they were about to realize their own unique life diagram, did not lose their nerve when things got tough and retreat into the woods like some spooked, world-weary Buddhist priest. And of this tiny handful, how many were strong enough to launch forth into the fraught literary world and channel spirit into quality literary labor? Finally, of this remaining handful, how many went on to offer up a regular stream of innovations in the arena of the Shosetsu through their literary labor? I can think of only one, Nagai Kafu, a.k.a. Kafu Sanjing, which might be translated as Kafu the Useless, or Kafu the Disengaged. In fact, Nagai Kafu gives no quarter to the notion that the writer must materialize his own special diagram of his own everyday life at any price, even at the risk of death. Kafu is exceptional in the sense that he alone was never burdened with that quintessentially modern compulsion to sacrifice one's own artistic sensibility to the standard life-based hypothesis, the notion that art must mirror lived experience. Unlike Kyoka, Kafu never writes himself directly into his works. He never assumes that sort of pose. Rather, he simply possesses an uncanny genius for actualizing an exceedingly pragmatic and flexible life diagram that is eminently conducive to the kinetic movement of spirit. Indeed, it is this versatility this talent for integrating life and art into a unified whole that the world often mistakes for a pose. Kafu may at times pretend to write in an artificial or mannered way, which on the surface may betray the air of an imposter or poser. Indeed, at a glance, the, his affectations seem to resemble the cool and disinterested pose of Moriogai, whose frequent ploy of designating himself as a detached, neutral observer of life, Bokansha, is well known. But in fact, Kafu's works are far less malignant than the kind of self-demarcating stunt committed by Ogai. 
Kafas, frequent amoral posturings and debauched affectations are simply a clever provocation to bait the hostility of his adversaries, the vulgar moralists who love to lash out at this and that, only to abruptly turn the table on these criti critics and expose their insuperable stupidity. Such provocations are always a deliberate game on his part, and in fact they may have a salutary, rejuvenating effect on conventional social mores and sentiments. In recent years, however, people have become a bit more discriminating, and they no longer react to such baiting. Nagai Kafa remains forever free and nimble within the space of his own loosely drawn life diagram, so, diagrams because he expand, expends whatever youth he possesses at each moment. This unflagging balance is both why he was regarded as prematurely old in his youth and why he seems to grow increasingly youthful the more he ages. Kafu vigorously lives out his private dreams and fantasies the moment they are conceived, yet he does this in such a refined way as to preserve the flower of his youth. Moreover, this vitality is what imparts to his writings their mellow, ripe maturity. It has always been the Far Eastern worldview to re regard the old man as happier and more fulfilled than the young buck. Kafu shrewdly integrates into his works the advantages of old age while simultaneously partaking of the sensuous fruit of youth through his body. This is indeed a most vigorous operation, one that proceeds with such velocity and force that it ultimately spawned a certain peerless work whose sharps sharp arrows pierce in one swift volley both life and literature. The work I'm thinking of is House for a Mistress. In fact, Nagai Kafu's House for a Mistress has no need for such things as schematic visual diagrams and fixed mindsets. In this work, Kafu uses the two opposite axes of life and literature to instantly differentiate the plane of his own authorial position then he patiently dissects and re resolves this formula in an illustrated coordinate graph as if it were a kind of design blueprint. Though the formalized world of House, of, for, house for a Mistress may appear still and tranquil, writing this agitated is extremely rare. And while the, whole, while the world of, his, of the work may appear to exist outside of time, its author, pressed for time, is ever mindful of the clock. The work is not at all like those personal grievances on the passage of time known as Jikai, Jukai, sorry, Jukai Lamentations, which are scribbled out by debauched literati. Instead, Kafu gracefully achieves the dialectical harmony between life and literature, nearly forfeiting his own life in the process. Because the work itself is so fleshed out and substantive, the actual body of its author remains forever hidden. Despite the work's expansiveness, it doesn't give you a sense of space. Its author never fails to seize the opportunities of each fugitive moment, boldly partaking in whatever life throws at him. The touching passages that appear to depict emotional entanglements of the characters are actually the interim progress reports about the advance of spirit. The same might be said about Kafu's numerous Zichtsu essays, but I shall not discuss those here. Although House for a Mistress may seem to re represent the ideal peripheral haven for old school literary poets and painter calligraphers, the so called gentleman scholar ink guests, Bunjin Bokaka of past epochs, the world is actually none other than the genesis of the modern Japanese shosetsu. In fact, it may even be the single most indispensable Yi Ping a work belonging to the so-called untrammeled class in Sino-Japanese art, in all Meiji and Taisho period literature. House for a Mistress appeared in an age when the world was rife with that mal nécessaire I spoke of earlier, that quasi-divine despot called politics, modern idea par excellence, the work, however, managed to cut against the grain of the age dominated by rampant politics. Its incisive criticality vis-a-vis -vis society emerges paradoxically precisely because its author disso disassociates himself from the political. Its setting, the Shotaka, literally a house for one's mistress, was an absolutely necessary topos for Kafu, 
a fateful space that seamlessly merges with the life of its famously uh, gynophilic, gynophilic author. Moreover, it is a highly ethical work. This may come as a surprise to some, but Kafu, you see, belongs to that special breed of moralists I call unconscious moralists. Kafu once said that uh, as a boy he read through the ethical teachings and precepts of Confucius and Mencius. Though we should not take this to mean that his life and literature are simple parables of the Confucian classics, at the same time it would be a mistake to assume that Kafu's moral and literary sensibilities are entirely divorced from core Confucian principles. In fact, I suppose the obscure source or wellspring of Kafu's elusive moral sensibility can be traced to those Confucian classics. Who knows? It may even be the case that Kafu's understanding of Confucius and Mencius is older, and by older I mean more faithful to its original tenets, than the standard interpretations. While the actual content of Kafu's ethical sensibility remains highly ambiguous and hard to discern, this ambigu ambiguity in no way implies that his works are amoral, as his critics would claim. And if this isn't the very definition of special breed, I don't know what is. People used to say that Kafu's story, A Celebratory Toast, Shkuhai, was a shameful, disgraceful work. Morioga condemned this moral outrage in an article published in 1909. Clearly, Kafu's work did not reflect the dominant mores of the age. This upset people. House for a Mistress, published two years later, did little to assuage this public outrage. Yet the petty critique of amorality from the small-minded public was not something that Kafu's monumental work itself was ever willing to countenance and accommodate. Imagine what would happen if House for a Mistress were published today in our current political climate. You can be sure that the same moralistic critique would once again be leveled at Kafu and that this accusation would be just as flimsy as before. On the other hand, Kafu might be denounced as a faithless heretic. After all, no god figures in the work and its author himself certainly displays no hankering for the divine. In those godless days of mid late Meiji, dominated by the rampant, unavoidable modern evil called politics, people did not denounce works of literature for being atheistic. Rather, this necessary evil called politics has been put to death. The gods to whom we should offer our prayers remain dead and buried in their graves. What divine spirits, then, if any, exist in our world today. Part 3 Though I have written this much under the titles Prayer, Norito, and Prose, I have yet to address the subject of Norito, or ancient Shinto ritual cantillations, and now my allotted space is nearly up. Since I will not have conveyed the essential thrust of this essay if I leave out this central subject, I shall run through my views on this subject as quickly as possible. For the, sake, for the sake of expediency, let's say that after finishing my coffee, I got up from my stool at the dinky cantina, scuttled over to the library, and managed to browse through the literature on Japan's antiquity. First, I scanned through the Kojiki, Japan's oldest extant chronicle, in search of any instances of the verb inoru, to pray. According to the Genkai Sea of Words Dictionary, inoru means to purify and proclaim as when performing ablutions or religious purifications. But these two actions, to purify and to proclaim, do not seem to correspond to our modern notion of kito or prayer. Next, I scoured the kojiki for any term or descriptions that might relate to this modern notion of kito, but still found nothing. Then I realized something. The mytho mythological gods described in the Kojiki have, may have taken part in Misogi purification rituals, but they were not the kind of gods who took part in prayers in the modern sense. After all, they themselves were divine nature spirits. So what did they have what need did they have for prayers? Ultimately, I came to the conclusion that the mythic world of the Kojiki cannot be understood through this modern conception of concept of prayer.
After scanning several more volumes for something related to Norito chants, I came upon a, re a related term, Toshigoi no Matsuri, the official annual spring harvest festival of offerings to the Shinto spirits of nature. But even this was only vaguely related to the notion of Kito prayer. Although the first character of this term is the same as that used in the verb inoda, or to pray, the meaning of this ancient festival cannot be understood through the modern lens of prayer. This is because Toshigoi no Matsuri were festivals held at the start of each spring harvest, where our ancestors would intone tataegoto, or eulogies and songs offered to the various Shinto springs spirits in return for a bountiful harvest in autumn. That is, there were annual festivals in which women and men would declaim eulogistic songs in sonorous, clear voices as they reverently entered the sacred presence of Shinto spirits. Norito ritual hymns, too, were among the eulogistic songs sung to these Shinto spirits who would regularly descend to earth to gather among mortals. But such things are altogether different from prayer in the Christian sense. Then suddenly it hit me. Our Shinto kami, or an, our Shinto kami of antiquity were the kind of divine presences to whom men and women would pray, would pay joyful tribute and celebrate after they had cleansed their minds and bodies through misogi ablutions. That is, they were not the kind of formal, distant gods of prayer, the kinds of gods to whom pious men cast their eyes, heave signs of grief, whimper in mawkish imploration, weep effusively, fall into the earth, and so forth. For these, after all, are the alien gods of foreign, distant lands. The Buddhist deities or Hotoke, worshipped by the ancient sculptors of Nara, were not gods born to this imperialistic dynastic island either. Nor, of course, was the Judeo-Christian god worshipped by the ancient artisans of France, a god native to France. That god has never been anything more than a mere hollow abstraction offering no more than empty promises while never deigning to descend to the actual ground of the real. The only thing that cold, the only thing that cold, indifferent God was good for was hoodwinking and misleading the credulous multitudes of women and men over the centuries. That France today has no other option than to clutch at the straws of this abstract, distant God is truly regrettable. A sad reminder that she is a thoroughly vanquished nation. The ancient Shinto spirits that would receive these Norito chants, songs that existed long before the modern notion of prayer was imported from China and the West, have once again descended onto our land after a long hiatus of more than two millennia. They have manifested themselves in all corners of our lives infusing themselves even in the swift movement of those majestic bicycles that took off from the street corner cafe a moment ago. No, no wonder those boys were so keyed up as they raced away beneath the midday sun. After all, since antiquity, all songs and poems intoned in resounding praise to the Norito divinities have carried this, that same exuberant spirit. In recent years, there are many counterfeit examples that are hastily improvised, particularly in the field of poetry. But where does our nation's prose fit into all of this? The fact that all forms of Japanese prose have their roots in these ancient Norito chants constitutes a, strange, a truly strange and novel experience, a momentous event that is without parallel in the history of modern-born prose. There is no precedent in the prose of any epoch or nation, east or west. Search high and low through the literary histories of every nation on earth, but you will not come across any similar example. Of all the writers living in the world today, it is we Japanese alone who have been charged with the heroic task of continuing to produce these ancient norito that were once sung to the Shinto gods. As luck would have it, the pens we wield are just as swift as the bicycles of those 
youthful merchants come soldiers. And so our only recourse is to push ourselves to churn out new and greater discoveries that will shatter existing paradigms and move heaven and earth. Even these new discoveries will be useless though, so long as they are conveyed in the usual over hasty and makeshift manner. Of the so-called Shosetsu being published in our recent journals, every last one is rubbish. These authors all don an inflated expression of profound grief, brooding endlessly about their own misfortunes, believing this to be the writer's chief task. The authentic Shosetsu, however, requires something else, a certain quality that these lugubrious, lugubrious writers, who are constantly putting on a long face, clearly lack. Even so, the vulgar public continues to regard these self-pitying hacks as deserving the prestige and status accorded to the true Shosetsu writers. Perhaps I should step back a bit and, basking leisurely in the spring sunlight here on the bench at the Ueno Zoo, set aside my Charles Pegui book and immerse myself once again in Kafu's House for a Mistress. It would be a genuine treat to flip through its pages while gazing up at the long neck of the giraffe and the white wings of the crane. A work of the so-called untrammeled class of painters and writers is a work that indisputably indis proves itself as such. House for a Mistress is precisely one such work. It possesses an almost classical burnish. Indeed, it almost qualifies as a vintage classic. The work is not something that can be readily accused of heresy, heresy by the proverbial sarachie or monkey wisdom concocted in the shallow minds of men. The vast and magnanimous Shinto Kami to whom the old Norito chants were directed would no doubt readily receive the work as a kind of prayer offering. It is in this sense that Kafu's House for a Mistress acquires the sublime status of Uzu no Mitegura, a paper strip ritual offering to the Shinto Kami. And this is precisely what makes Kafu Sanjing, Kafu the useless, disengaged man, such a distinguished treasure. <laughs>